Alô, alô, alô. Song. I didn't quite get that. Was that Heiner? Whoever said that. Yes. Here. This was Heiner with sound check. Sound check. Check. Here's my sound check. Burp. Check. Mate. <laughs> I haven't done a sound check. We hear you. So, Alex, what happened to your off by one clock? I've got to reset my system time. I have to reset the internet time by going online and adjusting the settings. <clears throat> that and I, lost, I lost a day. I lost a whole day. <coughs> I thought I did anyway. <laughs> That matrix raining down on your video is supposed to be there? Yeah, it's an effect, I think. It's an intentional effect? No, it's not. It's an artifact from the incorrect driver setup. <clears throat> this is a Linux system, Linux Cinnamon, Linux Mint, and it automatically it turns the drivers from the manufacturer. I see. Heiner is doubly present. All right. Man, what a busy week for me. I actually had a lot going on this week. Recording in progress. <laughs> okay. How are you guys? Anybody want to check in? I might if I find myself. <laughs> Where am I? How's the war going in the Ukraine? It's slowing down according to uh, at least some reports. NATO have been taking a battering in the news media, mainstream media. All There's I know somewhere. is they're all meeting someplace, but Brussels? I don't know. Yeah. Who is so, parents and caregivers for wellness? Oh. Hmm. They're no longer there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, all right. Well, I guess uh, we could be dispensing with check-ins. People don't seem to find the need to do so anymore. Oh, I have a small win to report. I, I have, I the condo that I live in is 35 years old and my heating system is the original heat pumps that they put in way back when. So my outdoor unit, um, there's a big blower fan on top. It just blows the air through the unit. It stopped running. And I thought, okay, this is the end of the line. But then I decided I'd troubleshoot it myself. It was just a detached wire that I had to reconnect and started the fan back up again. So... How did that make you feel, Barry? Uh, well, I, I was pretty happy that I <laughs> that I, I could limp along with this ancient unit, at least for through the summer. They're not very efficient in the winter time. They don't really pump that much heat, about a 30 degree temperature difference between outdoors and indoors. So if it's below 30 degrees outside, they can only pump another 30 degrees to 60 inside, which isn't very good on really cold winter days. You know, that's not the impression I get from my heat pumps. Maybe that's because they're more uh, modern, but boy, my heat pumps are super effective. Well, first of all, it doesn't get that cold where you live. And second of all, you have the newer technology, the not the old R22 uh, system. That's true. 
the worst I've ever seen it here is down to the twenties, which I guess in Celsius is maybe like minus five. Yeah. Right. And, and probably yours can pump maybe at least a 40 degree temperature difference. So 20 would take you up to 60 at least if you're with your unit. Well, my basement master bedroom is half subterranean. And so when it's like in the twenties outside, it can get to, I could pump it all the way up to nineties. It really, really, can. yeah. Is it very well insulated also? Probably is because yeah. definitely I could be breaking a sweat and it could be in the twenties outside. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. The other thing is that um, you can't, well, you can still get free on at very, very high cost to uh, upgrade you know, recharge and open. They've also in, invented these uh, substitutes for Freon 22, like there's one called Blue On, but I haven't found anybody who will give me a quote locally on recharging my units with Blue On or something comparable to it. Okay. All right. Anyone else? I was actually hoping that Glenn would show up because Glenn posted another follow-up to his very long commentary. And that was attached to the conversation between Doug and me. And that's also drawn kind of really significant uh, interaction, engagement. You know, Sometimes I think uh, Glenn's posts are too long, nobody reads them. But then sometimes I think, boy, they're really, really well considered. He took a lot of time to do this, and I better give him some, you know, good consideration here. And evidently, some other people think that as well, because he's definitely got some engagement. And just this past week, I think he posted another follow-up to to it. So I was curious whether or not you guys had seen it, and whether or not uh, we would be able to talk about it. But I was hoping Glenn would be here if we did that. I think I saw it, and I may even have read it, but I don't actually remember the uh, differential content. Okay, then uh, let me post that link here. Yeah. Unfortunately, these Facebook links are super long. Okay, see if that link works. Let me see if that link works. All right, go to the chat here. I'm going to see if that brings it up for me. It appears to. Yes, it does. Oh, then I don't need to check it. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. He posted it about, about four days ago. That's right. So I don't remember much about it. Okay. So last week, one more topic is, I said I was going to get a little bit more um, formal with regards to a shared group memory. I also further mentioned that I was going to set it up on GitHub. And I know that that's a uh, interesting decision to many of you here, uh, but so now I have a repo called Global Challenges Collaboration or something like that in GitHub. And I'm going to first post uh, something regarding RFCs. I'm going to post something regarding agreements. I'm going to post something regarding a charter, all for review. I may also post a quote unquote semi-formal members list. And uh, that's where I'll start. So I just thought I'd let you guys know that uh, I'm proceeding along that plan. All right, other than that, I have my standard list of notes, which we could uh, delve into unless other people have topics of interest. All right, I'm gonna read one more comment that I posted several weeks ago. I forget exactly in response to what, but I'm going to read it anyway and just get it on the record here since we're recording. And it goes like this. 
privilege, leisure time, absence of survival focus, psychobabble, pseudoscience, all are enablers of our downfall when they allow dismissal and devaluation of science, truth, true inquiry, and ascribe magic, mysticism, enlightenment, intuition, and knowing to guide lives. I think that was probably in response to one of your posts, Barry. Could be. Maybe about misconceptions as a reaction to misconceptions. Yeah, I think it was the thing about um, pseudoscience, your post on Yeah, pseudoscience. pseudoscience and misconceptions, yeah. Yeah. It's a hobby horse of mine. It's, it's not just a hobby horse. It's, it's a crucial component of survival of the civilization, I believe. It is, yeah. If you're unfit to survive because you're laboring under a bunch of misconceptions, you're going to blunder. And blundering is not good for long-term survival. Blundering is okay if it doesn't interfere with those who are not blundering. But there's a lot of blundering that's now interfering. At and very high levels of yes. power. Yeah. Very high levels of power. Okay. Which, again, in case it doesn't draw much content, is in the context of this notion of critical thinking. Right. Okay. So I just wanted to indicate that I'm starting an outline on critical thinking. And it's got your characteristics of pseudoscience, you know, those 11 characteristics. It's got another bullet called evaluate supporting evidence and reasoning. It's got another one called do not commit logical fallacies. Yeah. It's another one called do not be absolutist. Another one called systems thinking. Yep. Another one called the scientific method. Another one called mathematics. Mm -hmm. Another one called logic. Yeah. Another one called probability. And then I've got the counter list. The list of other more questionable practices. And on this, I've got about another eight or nine items. I've got quantum everything, woo-woo hmm. enlightenment and light working. Zodiacs. Yeah. Religious thought. Political rhetoric. The absence of journalism. And then scientific journalism, which I put in double quotes. So if you'd like to help me or engage on fleshing out some of these components of critical thinking, that would be cool. Yeah, journalism is sometimes in the business of dumbing down. And some amount of dumbing down is necessary because you can't present you know, PhD level content to the general public, but it's commonplace to overdo the dumbing down to where you've thrown away um, the real important content. And you're left with, you're leaving people with uh, uh, misinformation. Yeah. Another level to the dumbing down is to extend ideas to domains where they actually do not apply. Correct. And that in particular, applies to this word quantum. Yes, entanglement, that just drives you up the wall when people yeah, yeah. throw around this cutesy poetic term entanglement because they can't talk about statistical correlation in a classical probabilistic statistics framework. Yeah. You know, I find that though, when people were reporting about the Higgs boson, or was it nine or 10 or however many years ago, that discovery, can you believe it's been almost a decade since the Higgs boson was discovered? Oh yeah that um, it's CERN, yeah. Yeah, scientists have a, a standard that they use in order to see whether experimental uh, conclusions and the results actually can be raised to the level of an actual real phenomenon. Yeah, near certainty. And most people cannot understand that concept. Yeah, five sigma. They say that if science says it's true, they think it's absolutely true. 
How, how does it apply to the real world? How, how do you apply things you can't see that are only mathematical equations in theoretical science? How do you apply those things to the human condition in the real world? You can only to the extent that you understand it. If the models are correct in physics, and correct, I see mathematically correct and agree with observation, then sometimes those same models can be used as an analogy for phenomena in the macro world or the human world. Not always, but, but I borrow a lot of models from science and find that uh, in human systems obey, the, obey, obey a very similar model. And so the insights and the diagnostic reasoning borrowed. And oh, by the way, on that second list, I'm not saying I don't believe in any of that. I'm saying I'm looking for evidence to support that. And without evidence, I have to sort of withhold a certain uh, amount of commitment to it. That's all so how do, you get how do you get funding to support the experiments that will provide evidence? You find people that take it seriously and understand the ramifications. So almost but every there's... idea has gotten funding, you know, distance viewing has gotten funding, you know, uh, all kinds of things get funding. I've spoken to at, at least, at least three or four scientists, like real scientists that have told me they would not even bring up an idea in their work. So I have a hard time thinking that, you know, there's a level playing field. That's a yeah. matter of training, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't claim it's a level playing field. I'm just saying it does happen. Well, also the prospect of commercialization. A lot of things are very pure research and don't have any prospect of commercialization that anybody can see. And that's harder to get funded than something that has a realistic prospect of commercialization within 10 or 15 years. You know, it'd be interesting because you would think <laughs> that people who believe in capitalism and believe in commercialism would put a lot of research into remote viewing and, you know, psychokinesis and all the sort of thing, telepathy, because it's clear that can be exploited capitalistically. Well, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're doing that. Are they, uh, Jeff Bezos is doing, doing that with the Earth Project, and Elon Musk is doing similar things. Even before them, there were people who were sending sensors, you know, to thousands of locations on the Earth trying to look for energy changes in certain frequencies. I know people who are actually doing that. Yeah, they, didn't they find a grid? I thought, I thought they found a energy grid system that looked like it was designed by intelligence. That I don't know. I don't, send me a link. I don't Alex. get the reference. Yeah, yeah must, have been, must have been a UFO website. <laughs> My guess would be that there's a research, but it's not made public, so that it can be. I mean, I, I remember reading through like some CIA papers that were about sound. Um, yeah. It gets too complicated for me. So, you know, I, at a certain point, I back off because I'm like, what's the point? Stacey, <laughs> what was the takeaway? The takeaway, well, I had already been working with sound. I had purchased uh, a very expensive sound bed that, um, that was a complicated thing. So I, I was already looking into it. So my takeaway was, yes, there is power here <laughs> and there's a lot more to be learned and it's over my head and not something that I want to delve into. There's a cute uh, video that you can find on YouTube. Um, you have a, an ordinary speaker pointed upward at, at the base. And if you uh, send just the right kind of sound through it, the right kind of vibration, you can get it to levitate a small object halfway above it. The sound just pushes it up and mm -hmm. levitate. And that's cute. It's, it's not very practical. It's just a, you know, it's a cute little science experiment, but it shows you what you can do with sound that's, you know, not obvious. I've seen that with water too, like making the um, flow of water move. Yeah. Is, is that part of the reason soldiers break step when they're crossing a bridge? 
well, it's related because it's got to do with resonance. It's like pushing a swing. You know, you don't have to be taught to push the swing when it's back at, at its highest level toward you. This is sort of intuitive, but that idea of only timing the push when it's optimal, that causes resonance. That's how also uh, stringed instruments work. You know, it, it's music and it's resonance and <laughs> it can have all kinds of interesting effects, not the least of which is pushing a child on a swing. Yeah. I'd like to see a crystal um, violin. Most people have a quartz crystal watches and there's a certain cri quartz crystal of a certain size and that size will support a vibration of a certain frequency and they're designed so that frequency is a multiple of uh, you know, the basic, uh, you know, the system for timekeeping. And that's how you get very accurate watches. They resonate at a very carefully chosen frequency. So it's, it's a quark resonating, it's a boson or a quark resonating at specific frequencies. And how can we tell whether the energy is up or down? Well, the answer to the first part is yes. And the up or down is just an orientation. So you, if you have, let's say you're, mm -hmm. you're you're keeping time for an orchestra, does it matter which is the up and which is the down? It's ha half a phase apart. So, you know, they call it the downbeat is sort of supposed to be the beginning of the of the phrase, but that's arbitrary. Would you use it with a quantum computing? You'd need to know at what stage, but at what state it was up or down, left or right, on or off, in exactly. order to get a in order to get some information out of it. I mean, if, if you have um, in your electrical system at home, you have AC, which is oscillating this way. But if you have two phase, 240 volts, the two lines are, off, are exactly out of phase. Each one is 110 volts, but they're 180 degrees apart. And between the two, you get 240 volts. That's, the, that's exactly 180 degrees opposite. That's a very powerful idea in electrical engineering. And you also have three phase, which is more complicated, but the same idea. And I can't imagine a computer running at high voltage. <laughs> they seem to be dropping in voltage. They're getting, they're using less in now smartphones are using tiny batteries. Yeah, they typically run at five volts, but most technology runs at five volts. Um, Transistor stuff. Electric there's stuff. a need for that. Yeah. There's a power, there's a different kind of power at the nano spectrum at the miniature in the miniature realm there's a different type of power because it's still information that's powerful as well as the energy yeah i mean your chips run at well something like two gigahertz which is pretty damn fast and they i think they might run at um, maybe three three volts or one or a half volts i forget exactly what the chips run at so, in case that doesn't draw enough uh, contact and engagement on the topic, the other one I have in my notes here, especially because of current world events, is this notion of balancing freedom versus the needs of a community. No, Individual can't. freedom versus the social good right. and we see this played out so many places today about people claiming their individual rights are violated their freedoms are violated right. no regard to implications on the social impact and i find that very very curious yeah there Our are freedom, some countries Sorry, go ahead, Barry. I was going to say, my freedom to swing my fist ends at your chin. Um, maybe even a little bit beyond A little that. bit before that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this all I want as long as your chin is not in the pathway. <laughs> so I find it, and this is going to be triggering to some, I find it common in some countries and not in others. Got it. So the clicking going on there. Uh, you got your you hot mic and Alex. Someone's no, no, that clicking. was new people arriving. 
No, there's somebody typing. Oh, could be. Yeah. Looks like Alex is very busy. Or somebody's clicking. I'm trying to find a mute, my mute with a microphone. Here it is. Okie dokie. <clears throat> so is what did Sam you say, I Sam? I missed. You said someone was going to trigger us. and I, I, just... I said this notion of this stretch, this tension, this... Uh, seeming dichotomy between individual freedom and community or village self-determination or social good and social justice. This tension exists in some countries, not so much in other countries. There's yeah. some countries that actually understand the good of the community, but man, do I find it very appalling that so many news reports, particularly here in the US, indicate that we don't see that. We don't see that balance. I think you know what I'm referring to. I well, could maybe, be. Maybe suing people for leaving Texas to get an abortion, for example. That's a, that one just is so far, far afield that it just boggles the mind that it's even considered legitimate. I think, I think what Sam brings up is, is very abstract and you know, you can reify, you can reify to these concrete examples. Um, to me, it's a what Sam is saying is <clears throat> the foundational consideration of what's better and what's the balance between what's better for me. And if my community all gets together and says, you know, you should really start believing in Jesus, <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, is that something I can do for my community? You believe um, in Newton? I don't believe, or you believe in Newton's model. You know, well, I'm just saying communities have this way of trying to figure out what's better, and then you might have your own ideas. That's 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 what I'm thinking. Go ahead, Sam. Stacy's got her hand up. Alex got his hand up. Then then I'll go. Well, I was just going to say I can only speak to the United States because that's really all I know about. And I think that one of the problems is we really don't have a shared value system, and there's also so much contradiction. You know, there are people that appear one way in work and then they appear another way in their private life. And I'll use a word that Barry hates in the entanglement. There is an entanglement of values and the way we think of things. And even people that try to not think from a capitalist point of view, it's so ingrained in us. So we look at things, caring for the person next to us. I mean, that's sweet. But if it's not something that brings in money, it doesn't really take on the importance that it should. So when Sam, I know what, when, you know, when you're talking about, you know, people that are so different, they think they have the same values. They just are going after it in two completely different ways. Like those people that are thinking they should be suing somebody for getting an abortion, in their head, they are freeing you know, they are helping people, they're helping these innocent children. They've got it so in their head. Um, and the, uh, and where, where the capitalism plays into it is the money that supports and amplifies some of these like political beliefs. Like if there weren't the money involved, I think some of these people would be looked at like, what's wrong with you? And it would go away. But because politics and money and all those things get entangled, we're in a mess. If a community had a, a way of clicking the like button, you know, when, when people like on Facebook, when people like something, there's a counter how many times the like is clicked. So if we had added a, a numerical value to the like button, and said, uh, we decided that the team would increase the value of that member's token if their likes reached 100, you know, for the month. Or if it just reached 100 without any time period specified so that the people in the group eventually, some of them would become more like than others. And the value of those likes would be reflected in the value of their non-fungible token or Bitcoin or blockchain 
entry in the ledger. They can be converted later when the group becomes so popular because people want to increase the value of their presence in the Zoom sessions and in the conversation, in the dialogues and debates, adding their humour and their art and their content and their sing-alongs and their, what I said, Barry does the send-ups, pantomime send-ups, anything that's of value that other people will recognise and would click on the button. If they click the button, you get an increase in monetary value that puts incentive into the system and it becomes a capitalistic way of gaining profit. Because if there's a lot of people involved, the advertisers will be sniffing around at the door with money in their hands because they want to put banner ads on your page and they want to they want to have a piece of the pie sort of thing because people, real people are here watching and commenting. There's no fake profiles. We got rid of them with the algorithms. Over. Heiner? Heiner? I find this question of uh, you very typical or very silly and really reflecting our Western situation. We speak in this um, dialogue design about situational complexity. And we try to always put it into yes or no, or there is a dilemma or um, a paradox. But in real life, it is not so simple. It is not just me and the big world. It is so much in between. And we have to, in the situational complexity, decide, is it good for the broader universe, for the living cosmos, for my nation, my region, my town, my, world, my family? And, and many issues are good on that side and bad on that side. And we never learn to draw a bottom line to see well, it might be against what I would like to have, but maybe it's good for my family and my neighborhood and my town. So this consideration of shades is not considered. You're always building up this, with your simple question, Sam, you're building up this dichotomies, this either or. But life is not either or. So anyway, I find this question revealing and I felt I should answer it. There's a, a great Latin phrase, qui bono, which literally means who benefits. And when you look at a proposal, you ask yourself the question, qui bono, who benefits if this proposal goes through and who ends up on the losing short end of the stick? Stacy? Yeah, I wanna... Um add on to what Heiner said, because people are not either or as well. And I think if we showed up as ourselves, if we really even knew who we were, and we weren't always hiding and pretending and stretching in ways that were uncomfortable, meaning saying what we don't believe or pretending that something doesn't matter, if we did that combined with not trying to control other people. I mean, a tree doesn't try to control another tree. If one's not hitting it, it sort of starts growing around it. I think it's those two things that really have to happen because most people are not 100% themselves. You know, I mean, they may get close to it, but, you know, I can't say I'm 100% myself. I know when I'm not, I know when I'm being quiet because I don't wanna face the consequences, but most people don't even do that. And I hear that so much. I am so shocked sometimes when I'm in personal conversations with business people and they start telling me about their personal experiences. And I'm shocked to find out that I actually think I have so much more in common with them than I thought. Um, that maybe Sam, they actually are light workers <laughs> in disguise. <laughs> Um, 
So I think it's those two things, being more of who we are, but imposing less of who, you know, of trying to control who other people are. I take it light is used as a metaphor as in enlightenment or mindfulness, seeing the light. That light has, has long been a metaphor for mindfulness. <sighs> So, I, I mean, I don't know what that means to other people. For me, it means I try to show up and I try the best I can to, to, not, fall, to not fall into like places of fear and anger and to just try to stay balanced in whatever's being discussed and to care about people, but not in a way of something I don't wanna do. Like, you know, I'm, if, if I really don't want to listen to a two hour lecture by one of you, I shouldn't be doing it because you may not see the negative results, but it's not a positive thing because I'm not being myself and I'm not energetically, and I know that word will bother Sam, I don't think something good is going on there. And I can't prove it, but I, I suspect that. Right, Sam. Can I go? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think that the, in light of previous comments regarding the understanding of critical thinking and probability and statistics and bell curves and that sort of thing, I find it curious that you would uh, frame my question in terms of an either or. Okay. I personally Who's don't. Who's you? Heiner. Okay. So I actually think that, you know, in the uh, existence of a bell curve, if one shifts, the entire curve could shift or, the, or just one end could shift, but basically it's still taking a statistical spread. Now, the fact that there are certain kinds of behavior at one extreme that I find curious and indicative of a lack of perspective, and I'll go ahead and say some of the obvious examples, you know, you don't have the right to tell me to wear a mask. You don't have the right to tell me to get a vaccine. You know, you can't require me to, you know, go into the store and wear a mask. I have a right to do whatever I want. I can carry my rifle into this, you know, food establishment. Those kinds of behaviors, yeah, which right. unfortunately journalism loves to play up here in the United States. Okay, that so you could say, hey, in a normal bell curve, you could have some extremes here, some extremes here, but man, especially with the magnifying glass of journalism focused on this one extreme and now we're bringing it to visibility and we're communicating it we're actually treating it as news and maybe rightly so because statistically there's an odd number of them and odd meaning particularly high okay i'm not saying anything is absolute heiner i'm not saying it has to be binary i'm just saying that in society if you see this preponderance of certain kinds of extreme behavior which reflects in my opinion, a lack of appreciation of other perspectives, of other beings, of other humans out there, then that to me is a sign of social disease. And I'm not saying it's absolute, I'm not saying it's binary, I'm just saying it's puzzling and it's problematic. And I'm saying it would be good to counter that because that kind of behavior, if it propagates, I think leads to detrimental impacts. And I think that that notion of freedom is an old, outdated, childish notion of freedom. That's the point I was trying to make. Over. If I could follow after you, Sam, because that ties in directly to what I'm talking about as individuals, because those extremes, that's been manipulated. That's been manipulated. So people that don't even think, yeah, they're taking my freedom away. I mean, I myself remember when they passed the seatbelt law, there was something inside of me that said, they don't have a right to do that. And it took a while before I realized, what am I getting so upset about? But not everybody does that. And now we're in a position that we have the media, it's not just the media manipulating people. A lot of us aren't even thinking. 
We don't take that is my point. That is my point, Stacey. But that but that's all of us. And so uh, like when I hear Alex talking about and your friends like it, I don't want the approval of other people. I want the space to think about what is this really about? And I want that to be encouraged. I don't want to do something because everybody else says this is the way to do it. That is not a good thing. So can I ask you a hypothetical question? Sure, I love them. Okay. So if you get one single message, forgetting all other media, forgetting Facebook, forgetting all other people, if you get one little message that says, hey, masks will cut down on the transmission of particular viruses and other people will be healthier if you wore a mask, please wear a mask. If you got that message, do you think that's sufficient? Yes, but I want you to understand that at the same time people were getting that message, they were getting another message, which was masks don't work, you're being lied to. So, you know, that's where trust comes in. Okay, if we take that and just push that a little bit further, okay, then take a look at the source of some of those messages. If you take a look at the source of some of those messages, some sources have been around for a while, have published other results, have some kind of quote unquote credibility. Other sources are relatively new. They're spouting other themes that can't quite be so readily uh, verified. I mean, there's a way to think through these things instead right. of just saying, oh, I've got two messages and they appear to be in conflict, right? But what typically happened, it happens all the time. The minute somebody like totally disagrees with you, in your head, it's like you shut down. This person is no longer a source of information. Who is you? So you general you. People, mm. people in general. If something said- So like, I was asking you a question for you, okay? You, Stacy. That was so a hypothetical me, question. Okay, so for me, number one, I believe that masks work because even when they initially said, you know, the CDC initially said you don't need an N95. I kind of knew they were just saying that so there wouldn't be a run on those masks. I suspected that. So I already felt like they worked. When I looked at other countries, I saw the ones that were using it, it worked. But when I spoke to people that didn't believe it, these were also people that, you know, I was connected to on a different so they spoke about the fear. So I went in a different direction. I said, well, if you know people are afraid and if you know wearing a mask will help them feel less afraid and will lower the overall stress, isn't it worth it to, to wear it for that reason? I didn't argue on a point of are masks you know, useful or not because there was so much information, reports. I read through lab reports and I would come back and I would say, this was not a good control group. I would give all the information. It was tiring for me. I got blocked from two people that claimed they just wanted people to think. So they knew they were spreading misinformation, but they had this greater purpose. That's what I mean. Like everybody rationalizes what they do in their own way. Heiner? Okay, Alex? I um, was going to talk about something about the uh, the bullshit that uh, about democracy. Hey, Alex, can I ask you, are you following up on a point of Stacey's? Because I have a point that's response to Stacey's. And in the interest of oh. focus, I was wondering if you could finish that point before we change topics. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, let's we'll see. <clears throat> Some people agree with the measures taken to reduce what they call public safety, um, improve public safety by adhering to mandates. But now they're lifting all the mandates. They're lifting the mask mandate in New Zealand, which they took a long time to get around to it, but it's happening all over the place. So were they right to do it in the first place or not? That's the question. Is it, be, is it because the new variant of COVID is less severe, even though it's 
more lethally spreading? I don't know. Maybe it's only old people in the vulnerable group that should be taking vaccines and um, keeping isolated. Over. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm just going to do this with my hands. Okay. <laughs> and Stacy, I'm going to respond to you in a certain way. Okay. Yes, I could say, let me take a very broad view, a broad perspective, okay? So broad that here's the planet, here's the galaxy, here's the universe, here's us on the planet, and 50 years from now, none of us are gonna matter. So I'm just gonna go out and just be hedonistic. I'm just gonna do whatever the heck I want. You know, I'm not gonna wear a mask. I'm just gonna go consume whatever I want without regard to anyone because 50, 100 years from now, it's not gonna matter anyway, right? That's one perspective. And that is cognizant of the greater impact, right? So I could do that. Some argue I'm already doing it. <laughs> yes, right. yes. So I, I just wanna point out, take two different people Neither one of them believes in masks. One person wears the mask to signal politeness and to show that they care about other people. The other person doesn't wear the mask because they want to show you they're not afraid or they're fighting for your rights. These are two people that in their own way care about something. So one is more focused on freedom and individuality the other is more focused on community. There's a place for both of those ways of thinking. So it's very sad that, you know, I really feel that if we hadn't gotten to this point where the way we react to each other is so negative, and I saw that happen, to, for me, 2016 was a big shift. I never saw people treating like, treating other people openly like that before. Once we got to that point, we got more and more divided because we didn't even try to find like, where do we agree? But I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, even people that I knew that didn't believe in wearing the mask, didn't want the vaccine, even they thought that these people that were walking into places and screaming at people without their masks, they recognized they were crazy. I shouldn't use that word, but they recognized there was something off. If we just treated people better, there would have been more leeway for the middle for the middle group. We're not going to help these extremist people because it's their emotions that are really out of whack, regardless of what side they're on or what they believe. Anybody else? Because I have a follow-up point to this question. Go ahead. Alex, you wanted to introduce a new topic? Yeah, there's a point about giving advice and it's to do with parents use it with children they would say don't tell kids what to do show them in other words because children don't do what you say children do what you do they copy your activity um, so you be an example you set an example it's like don't scream at people wearing not wearing masks because you're setting an example then you can politely announce that the fact they're not wearing a mask concerns you greatly Without, without the emotional effect of going off, going off with them about their behaviour or they're a bad person or making a judgment over. Okay. okay. There's, there's another example that everybody's familiar with. If you go into a restroom in a restaurant, there's typically a sign that says employees must wash hands before leaving suggesting that everybody probably ought to wash their hands because you're in a restaurant where food is being handled, but it's mandatory for the employees. It's not mandatory for the patrons, but it's advisable for good reasons. So my ulterior motive, if there was one, for asking that earlier question is are we able to level up? Are we able to get out of our own heads thinking of our own considerations and actually then have a more interesting, more complex mental model? 
that rather than just myself and the universe, I exist in this place with lots of other individuals, each of whom have the same considerations, concerns, interests, pains, traumas that I've got. Sorry, not exactly the same, but a suite of them. I'm curious whether we can actually level up. I'm curious whether or not civilization can level up. Because in my mind, if we don't do that adequately to a significant level, I think our demise is close at hand. And I'm not just trying to be dramatic. Yep. I think we have to start small. If we're not able to do that with the immediate, you know, the people who are directly in front of us, then yeah, we should not be talking about how, you know, a bigger entity should do it. Absolutely. That is an absolute. That's why I keep asking, what have we accomplished in five years? But I'm saying it's not nothing. We have this um, statement coming up about uh, the objectives or the mission mission statement. <clears throat> what did you call it, Sam? The statement of the mission statement or the criteria for taking part in this activity means you agree with the, uh, the purpose of the group and you're willing to take part you become one, you become recognized and you go, go on the books and you go on a file somewhere <clears throat> so that you're recognized as one of the people who stood up and raised their hand and said, yes, I'm in, locked in. Because, you know, without that, where are we going? I might have called it a charter. But uh, I want to welcome, I guess we did hear briefly from Colin, but uh, Colin and Thies and uh, I guess we yeah. heard briefly from Heiner and Kayla and Josh. Oh yeah, Josh is here. Welcome. Well, Any question? Question? No, well, I'll just, the question is a welcome. Yeah, Stacy. So I'll just say something since nobody's talking. When, when I was creating my game, I had one rule. And the rule was, don't do anything you don't want to do. And the purpose of that rule was, to real, was for an individual to really get to know themselves. That doesn't mean you don't, there's different reasons we do something. So it's okay if I do something because I'm doing Sam a favor. That doesn't mean, I, you know, I may not be something I love doing. You know, if you ask me to clean your toilet bowl, it's not something I love doing, but I may do it because you're feeling really sick and you need somebody to clean your toilet bowl. But the point is to really be clear on what your true nature is and what you choose to do. Because I really believe if people really follow their true nature, and they weren't afraid of looking nice or looking kind or any of those things, we'd be in a pe better position because we'd know who we were dealing with and people would fit into the right place. Um, I'm not comfortable working with everybody because there are certain things where our styles are different. That doesn't mean I think they're a bad person. That doesn't mean I wouldn't want to you know, pizza with them but I'm not gonna to wanna to work with them. I'm not gonna to wanna to spend too much time with them. Um, I don't like being around people that are very negative and always talking about that'll never work. That's not, that's not good for me, but I should know who that is. There've been too many times where I have met people and they say all the lovely words about love and hope, but you later find out when you observe them, <laughs> <laughs> that those are just words. Those are words to say, hey, I'm a wonderful person. But if it's not who they really are, and maybe, and I'm, <clears throat> let me be clear, because I think human beings 
are born loving and beautiful. So let me start with that. But throughout their lifetime, situations may happen that cause them to put on shells or become less heart-centered. Whether they choose to address that, that's not my business. My business is doing what I need to do. And if that means not being in close vicinity of those people, then that's what I'm going to do. So I used a lot of words, but all I really want to say is to thine own self be true. And that is not necessarily a selfish thing because I think that by doing that, actually do help the rest of the world. Practice what you preach. <clears throat> yes. I'm in that quandary myself right now. Do you want to say more about that, Sam? Maybe. <laughs> Later. <laughs> After we start. You know, for much of my life, I was living that particular perspective. And I don't know whether it's geography. I don't know whether it's my age. I don't know whether it's my new awareness. I don't know what it is, but... I seem to encounter more in the last decade, people who would be reasonable recipients of that advice, but their trauma makes it very, very difficult. And to protect myself, I could say, okay, I will choose to go my own way. It's up to you to work on yourself. And it takes a certain level of healing for a person to be even able to start that process. And the society that we think we all wanna co-create together, where everyone's thriving, where everyone's resilient, where everyone has what they need, to me, that society doesn't allow me in my current frame of mind to abandon people who are still hurting and have not yet found that path for themselves. That's my quandary. And it hurts and it's difficult and it sometimes triggers and it creates difficult moments and I could be a whole lot more meditative, a whole lot more calm, a whole lot more serene if I just shed those people. I know I could be. But I don't feel like abandonment is the solution. If I could just say one thing real quick, because I know Alex has his hand up. There's a lot of discernment necessary, necessary to know when you're enabling or when you're helping. And sometimes there's also something in us that wants to see ourselves as helping and healing and we get those wires crossed. I've heard that too. I've become um, better able to respond to situational events when I remember the prevention is better than cure that philosophy that uh, has stood me in good stead over the years is um, often a time when i'll want to respond to somebody and cut them down because of their stupidity or you know to boost my own brilliance and my own ego but i've hesitated because i've thought it's not going to improve anything it's not it's not going to be no benefit from doing that apart from a negative one, my ego getting boosted, which shouldn't get boosted, and the other person feeling downgraded because of the insult and the chest gestation. So prevention is better than cure. Maybe I could change my tactics and offer, offer something more constructive rather than criticism, blatant criticism designed to improve my own ego and not uh, not help the individual who needs it in my view they might not want it in their view 
Over. I would, I would just to add to what Alex just said, um, I would say helping the person that's helping themselves is a much better alternative because then there's a better chance that they will then be, be able to help other people. But I don't think you should put in more effort than the individual themselves is putting in. You know, look to help those people that are already help, trying to help themselves because some people don't want the help, even, you know, even on an unconscious level. Go ahead. Sometimes that effort is not so easy to discern from the outside. Um, and it takes quite a while for certain small behaviors to manifest themselves before they become a habit, before they become a part of one's life. And a certain amount of patience with certain people might actually be very, very helpful. What I'm trying to figure out is, can we build a social fabric among ourselves that doesn't abandon, that actually supports? And it takes a certain amount of strength, I think, to know, yes, I could be in a meditative calm. I could be in a serene mountaintop. I could just go out to my backyard, just look over the water. I could just live that life. But to me, there's something that doesn't allow me to do that. And I don't think it's ego. And yet, if we all did that, we'd have no problem, would we? I don't think so. I don't, I'm not sure what you're saying. I'm saying if every one of us lived in that meditative state. <laughs> yeah, but that's a vacuous statement. We don't. And not all of us <laughs> can. <we> don't. <laughs> right? But again, so that goes to the things we do to help. So do I think we should be working on a society that produces less stress? Yes. That's where I think our efforts should be. Yes. And that should be focused on food and uh, yeah, food, food, food for sure. Everybody should be fed. <laughs> um, but as far as individuals, especially if we're talking about people in addiction, I'm going to go back to the prevention is the best cure. Let's stop creating societies that just increase those kind of stressors. Yeah. And I do agree from a social standpoint. But then there are the individuals who have already come through that pain. And because of the way society is structured, their options are limited. They don't have the same quote unquote choices, freedoms that let's say people who didn't have that pain, didn't have that trauma have at their avail. All, all I could say is just remember, always put your own air mask on first. <laughs> In the airplane. Yeah. 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 What, what kind of mask? Air mask, you know, in the airplane, Oxy they oxygen mask in the oxygen, airplane. Oxygen. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's important, especially if the uh, cabin loses pressure. <laughs> right, but the <laughs> point is, them. they tell you to put your own first before you help other people. Right. Oh yes, yeah. Well, that goes back to prevention better than cure. But you know, I got over trauma in my life and entered my own death which was inevitable at the rate I was heading. And I did it because I had the help from the others in the group using those 12 steps and the 12 traditions. That's what made the group. The 12 traditions made the group successful and spread across the world. And I think the group in and of itself, I mean, I, I think healing groups are the most powerful that I've ever seen to be with a trusted group of people where you all know that you care about each other, you're helping each other. But I know, because I, I was a substance abuse counselor, so I know that people call other people out. 
They don't just, you know, listen to the bullshit, you know, and, and be nice. They say, wait a minute, you're full of shit. That's important too. Tease put something in the chat, but maybe Tease, you could get it on the record talking about that Friday meal. Is he frozen? Muted? Um, can't tell. He might be frozen. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is oh, he, no, he, un he unclicked. There he goes. There he is. Okay. I'm loud and clear. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm just uh, volunteering. I had COVID uh, a week ago, so I was in isolation. But uh, late this Friday, I was volunteering. So we, uh, so it's a Christian group that started for the, the community meal. So in the start, I find out that in order to organize it, uh, to have a structure that it would sustain, that I asked them that they, sh that they would be forced to have a prayer be in, in advance for getting the meal. And that helps to have uh, some uh, peaceful uh, attitude in the group. So anybody can come. So I don't have to be Christian, but uh, I need to have. Uh, I'm a well old guy, of course. So that means that uh, I see the process. So we have a cultural background of Christianity. So this helps because the group that organizes it is Christian. So that's part of it. But then, uh, okay, everybody can come and write his name down on a list and then we'll go to eat. We have a volunteering cook, so this is a professional guy that does it voluntarily. So well, he has his background. And, uh, so I, I can't say anything about what that, I, that I've written down because it's an experience. So how to put it in words? Uh, it becomes a trusted community. So someone that never was there just came in and Kay told about all the problems that she had. So just out of the blue, so as if it's you're on the street, someone come. But so she felt trusted and she told all the bad things that happened to her. So it's so what can I say? It's a real life gathering. We are so much apart physically here. So we can't get the social, uh, how do you call it, the density. Uh, also, during the day, it's the morning coffee, it's from 10 to 12, so other people can meet at the same place. Some come also to eat in the evening, and then it opens again at 3 o'clock, and then we have the meal at 6 o'clock, and then everybody goes away before 8 o'clock. So the dishes has to be done, the food has to be uh, distributed. We do it like that because of, of course, if everybody takes only his own share, might be taking too much. So I was part of sharing the food. So I know, okay, we have salad for 20, 26 people. So if I share it, I have to make small portions and then that can be shared for 26 people. So it's very uh, real, a real sharing of food. But then, uh, so the small token, people pay. So three and a half euros is the minimum. So anybody who's richer can pay more. So, so it's a real, real time of this. So you have to be with it to experience it. And of course, it's within the Dutch culture. I mean that we are talkative. So, and the, but the silent people can come, anybody can come. So it's, uh, so it needs a basic group that, that learns to know each other. And this has happened. But now because COVID restrictions are gone, so latest Friday was very successful. So no masks anymore since the 23rd of March. So, uh, yeah. so it's uh, it's opening up again now. And it's springtime. You could sit on the terrace. So what can I share more about it? So that's what I want to tell. Any questions? I just wanted to bring out that importance of community, you know. It's great that um, groups are getting together and feeding the vulnerable, but you've got to have some traditions and structure involved because a lot of these groups 
attract uh, Christian or fake Christians who are pred predators. They are, they're there to take advantage of the vulnerable people. And so keeping them at bay, catching them out is is critical and it involves having the others in agreement with the traditions that um, that sort of thing, whenever it's encountered, will not be tolerated. Well, Over. it's it's happened, of course. It's uh, happened, of course, uh, Alex, but uh, we know. So you have a basic group. The group is large enough. We know each other. So some are very strong Christian. That's okay. You can, but so there's no preaching surrounding that when we if they have our food. So they have a Sunday meeting, meeting, of course, then it's different. Then, of course, there is some leadership. And uh, so, so on the Sundays, it's different. But on the Saturdays, it's not uh, meant for uh, any preaching or so. It's just community. It's getting a density of social relations in the area where you live. That's basic. I know. I mean, that's my intention. So that's what I can communicate when I'm there. And it's, it's like that. So we hear. Yeah. And the more people, say, guys 60 plus are with there, so they know and they, they, we, can, we can share, we can understand how we are working together. Yeah, and it's not just for vulnerable people. That I think that was not a correct assumption. It's, it, I don't, it's for a community. Well, someone, Someone comes who has uh, glut uh, no uh, lactose-free, gluten-free. Right. So, no, so, mean... so this is vulnerable. She cannot speak very well. Someone knows how to handle her very care kindly. So she feels accepted as she comes. And so that she cannot talk anything. So it's very difficult to, for her to communicate. But she's, she is present. She comes to eat and so so it's, she needs uh, attention and sh and uh, care, and uh, no, so it's happening like that. That's very. So we need. We are together in making it such happen because it's for all. It's fun to have everybody being able right. to to share, and the, the woman that came but uh, had big problems. Her uh, scootmobile was uh, destroyed. Uh, that's why she couldn't come a week ago. Now she came with to share an extra scoot mobile. So the whole story around it, how she got uh, a spare scoot mobile for for temporarily and so on, and how it was destroyed, etc. And uh, her own uh, fear part of it because it happened in near where she lives. So very stra strange uh, story. I mean, it's a real life story. It's very difficult to handle to to come. To come to a solution, but she was able to speak about that. So that's uh, that's happening. It's real, real life. System. Sam, I like hearing stories like that. I forget exactly whom, but I think it might have been just Winter and a few of my other friends uh, from, I believe, Jainism or Sikhism that also believe in feeding before preaching, probably feeding without preaching. And uh, I think that's a humanitarian behavior that I'd love to see uh, more. I wanted to introduce something else that happened to me in the last week or two. There's been someone, and that person has actually come to GCC one time that I remember, okay? And that was years ago. And I thought, you know, curious. But just a few weeks ago, we started a conversation. It was actually here on the island. And I found out, unfortunately, that this person, last April, was given six to eight weeks to live. And she's managed to live about 10 or 11 months. She's worked for decades in a nonprofit trying to provide shelter for uh, women who have a need, either abused or battered or, you know, abandoned. 
And she reached out because she knows she cannot take that nonprofit to where she wanted it to go. And I was honored that she had a conversation because she is asking me to consider taking on that nonprofit and making sure that it doesn't die. So if there is such an opportunity, I would think that'd be something that might open up a way for us to work together. Some of us who really want to do something like that. And at the same time, very supportive to see, you know, how I might help this person go another year or two or three, if it's possible. So I'm just really appreciative of those kinds of conversations, those opportunities. We'll see if it, um, comes to be. I'm not even saying it's a good idea for me to do it. I'm just saying it's an honor to even have that conversation. Have you thought about what that would entail? <clears throat> He's collecting materials for me to review <laughs> and we're thinking about taking the next steps just to you know do our due diligence, both sides. You know, in having those conversations, it's still kind of appalling to me, the kind of behavior that uh, she experiences. One story is about someone that she contracted to do some work with her. And because she lives alone, she got some very unwanted, unsolicited, inappropriate attention and behavior. Why does it happen so pervasively? Oh, from a man, in case it, that needed to be said. There's a lot of men who don't have the decorum or the tact that's involved when if you're chatting up a woman because you like her and you like to have sex with her or take her out, <laughs> then you've got to have some decorum and tact and intelligence. Otherwise, you're just a moron trying to take advantage of a, somebody. And she can see that. She doesn't appreciate that, obviously. Oh. Yeah, what was, uh, what's becoming more apparent to me recently is just how often this happens. So uh, I'll say the unpopular thing. <laughs> so yes, it, do, it does happen all too often. That being said, sometimes people that are traumatized take things differently. So you know, I, I, you know, I don't know the story. I don't know what happened. And, and that's the whole point. I don't know the story. I don't know what happened. So I can't just assume. I know myself, I've been in conversations. I think I've mentioned this once here um, where I got like a really like over the top reaction from a woman and I recognized, oh, she came from trauma, you know, sexual trauma. And that's why she reacted. So like, this was horrible, but um, 
you know, got to keep that in mind too. We have to keep in mind where the storyteller is coming from. So, you know, I mean, some things are obvious, but again, without, you know, knowing the facts, you know, that's like what people do every day. They watch a news report and they have all, all these really strong opinions about all these people they've never met and they don't know all the leaps that were taken along the way. But yeah, men are terrible. No, <laughs> no we, we, have, we have power issues. We have issues of power that are not just men, women, <clears throat> power. I mean, I, I hate when I see people dressing their dogs. I think they're exerting too much power. <laughs> Get my coffee. I saw a far side cartoon which made me laugh, and it was a, a guy balancing a biscuit on his dog's nose and saying, Wait, 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 okay. And then the dog can eat the biscuit. And the dog's got a bubble of thought above his head saying, I'm going to kill him. So all these shares, at least for me personally, are about what kind of coexistence we want. What kind of coexistence we want to manifest and co-create. And no, it's not binary. which introduces this notion of balance. What is balance? What's the proper way to think of balance? There's a great piece of art that shows a person on a tightrope with one of those balancing bars, but there's a weight hanging on each end. And on one end, the weight is a brain and the other end is a heart. How do, how do I balance the knowledge I have with the emotion that's attached to the suffering people who are going to experience more suffering if we don't do something. <clears throat> Is it does that outweigh does the, the number of people who suffer outweigh the uh, benefits that they'll get from acting early? Probably. So there's some hard decisions to be made. I, my heart goes out to these politicians who are working for the environment legislation and trying to tax, introduce taxation for the wealthy corporate elite. I mean, they get hammered over. I think the goal is for the brain and the heart to be in alignment. And again, you start with the person right in front of you. So before you're trying to save the world, you have to be interacting with the people in front of you using your brain and your heart and making sure that they're in alignment with each other something's off if they're not the person in the mirror mm -hmm. one thing that we could do though is be kinder when people recognize their mistakes because it's very difficult for some people to acknowledge their mistakes based on how they've been ridiculed or mocked or in some way traumatized in their past. So if we could be a little bit more receptive when somebody's willing to say, you know, I screwed up, I think that could go a long way. And that's not the same as enabling because you also, with that, it's implicit that you will try, well, you, you will, be working to not make that same mistake again. My biggest mistake is failing to diagnose and correct my own mistakes. It's my yeah. meta mistake. 
you know, there's a, a saying that um, do do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, one of the golden rules. And Jesus mentioned it, I believe, that was mentioned in the Bible or attributed to people in the Bible. But it was Elon Musk who was talking to the Christian group and he was saying, they asked him if he believes in Jesus. And he's sort of looking at them and he's thinking, I believe there was a person with that name who lived many centuries ago. That was, and what he, what he's, what's attributed to that person are very honourable statements that I do, I do have uh, a connection with and believe in, especially the one to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But you know, it's like um, when you look at the other things that are in the Bible. Whether I believe in that or not, it's a different story. That's there's some things in the Bible that are like punishing children because they were ill. Which I don't agree with, and uh, that's in Deuterometry. It says take take those children that are vagabonds and drunkards to the gates of the city, and the elders will stone them to death. I mean, goodness gracious me, <laughs> a lot has changed since those days. That's in the time when they believed that. Alcoholism was a, uh, a, a indication of evil possession, I believe, or something like that. <clears throat> so, spirit, so superstition <clears throat> and fantasy are what are tied up with this belief that uh, Jesus was God, the Son of God. If if we are all people like Jesus was, then we are all the Son of God. Every one of us. We we find that out when we go through the door to enlightenment. When we when we open our heart to the truth the, of the universe that is apparent to the scientific inquiry that we have available today. Over. I want to pick up on the do unto others thing because I also want to point out. And this comes up in personal relationships and, um, you know, not everybody wants the same thing. So, you know, there are people that, you know, they will come and they'll like give you all this, they'll give you things because that's what they would like. And then they, they would get upset because you didn't appreciate it in the same way that they would. And this may not be the best example, but the point I'm trying to make is that Sometimes we do things for other people based on what we would want. And that's not necessarily what they would want. So I think it's important to know from the person themselves, what is it they need? What is it they want? Rather than we decide what they need and what they want, which is a mistake that I think happens a lot. I have a friend who is a uh, life coach and uh, his uh, theology is that when communicating with people, disclose three things. Number one, your needs. Number two, your emotions. Number three, your requests. Yeah. That's very hard for a lot of people to do. Absolutely. But that's, that's his theology. Disclose needs, disclose emotions, disclose requests. And, and I think that the, the work of a life coach is helping people to figure out what those are for themselves. Yes. Because a lot of people don't know. Yeah. What is the name of your need? What is the name of your emotion? Yeah. What is the content of your request? What did you call that, Barry? It's all part of what? Some ology? I called it the, the theology of a friend of mine who was a life coach. That's uh. the essence of what he uh, communicates when he's doing life coaching, how to identify your needs and disclose them, how to identify your emotions and he disclose them, and how to frame your requests. That's his theology of, of a life coach. And it's hard to, it's very hard to take a theology and reduce it to practice. Yeah, you, fo you fooled me there with the word. I had to double check what you, where you're coming from. Makes sense. Theology of a coach. Yes. Yep. It's, your, it's a set of beliefs. It's a set of core beliefs yes. of what yeah. constitutes his practice. So the practice 
derives from his beliefs. His beliefs is his theology. It's what he believes in. It's his teachings. Yeah. What what use word do you usually hear people say instead of theology? Because that's that's kind of a weighted word, eh? Well, they say some people say philosophy, core principles. Yeah, yeah, the principles. Yeah, you got me there. You made my ears perk up. I said, oh, is he yeah. preaching? <laughs> you know, uh, for example, you can believe in the teachings of Pythagoras, which is just to say you adopt and employ the, the, uh, uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Some people also, quote, believe in Pythagoras. That is, he they sort of deified or heroified Pythagoras. You can believe in the models that yeah. Newton provides. You can also deify him. So in the olden yeah. times, it was much more common to deify um, a guru. T today, especially in science, you don't elevate Einstein or Newton or Feynman to, to deity status, even though in, in a, some sense, they, they are revered as, as sort of the givers of the law. Revered and pitied equally. <laughs> well, I don't know about pity, but uh, <laughs> the thing is- pretty eccentric. You gotta be pretty eccentric to get up on. <laughs> but, but you can you can believe in the teachings of of any teacher, including Jesus or Moses or Buddha or Lao Tzu. Or, you know, you can believe in their teachings without necessarily re considering them to be a deity. But they're the father of their profession, the father of their teachings. So they're you know it's just kind of a sloppy use of words or fluid use of words. Older older generations. We're more likely yeah. to deify the father of some philosophy or teaching. We don't do that so much today, but it's basically a similar idea. Well, that seems to be what Sam's trying to put down with um, his um, attempt to give us a little bit of a collaboration bed through maybe collaborating through. I guess he's going to use GitHub. It's quite a it's quite an interesting thing. Uh, maybe when we get some stuff in there, we can give it little demo tutorial how people can contribute i don't know i assume that you could contribute secondhand as well if you just know, know how to get there you you don't necessarily need to know how to run the interface day one right sort of same thing with trello you know if you wanted something in trello and we were going to use that as a tool then we could get facilitators to help do data entry while people learn how to use the tool right i think it would be a great idea even some tutorials on it, like um, could teach other people, right? Collabor collaboration. So I, I like what Sam's doing with, with the idea of the agile because people can go at their own pace, their own size pods. Um, you can come and go and it's protected. So it's interesting. And iterative, tracked. It's, it's memory, it's, it's intel information memory. And reducing them to practice. Religion is really about reducing theology to practice. It, it's one thing to have a theology, just a set of core principles. It's another thing to ritualize them into a practice. But ritual is one of the ways that people maintain a practice. It's like the, um, the Alcoholics Anonymous has a ritual, which is to, yeah. which is to be able to maintain the practice and not depart from it. So we need a theme song, Barry. We, we need Barry to get on the uh, Weird Al Yankovic of JCC. <laughs> well, I would I would encourage Sam to go um, more into the first topic of today, maybe to end. end or I don't know, I don't want to direct the show. He seems to be off maybe getting some things straightened around this morning. So I know it's early for Sam. For me, it starts at noon, so I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I've already been to the library this morning with the grandson. Oh my God, I got a picture. Maybe I'll share it on our, our, our private chat. It's amazing stuff, yeah. Yes, COVID's lightening up. So it was like it was it was weird being at the library and seeing people. It was almost like, are these fellow monkeys here on this planet with me, <laughs> reading books? 
I thought libraries were a thing of the past. Yeah. Oh my goodness, they got this checkout thing. The kids can go up to the counter and it's got a double-sided laminated thing. Barry could uh, uh, relate to this because of the museum, how they treat kids. They cater to kids, right? Yeah. And oh, they just they just love it. You know, they take a little school bus or, you know, a box of dinosaurs. We counted, there was 12, 12 dinosaurs. And yeah, all kinds of stuff. Had a little farm and had, two doors on each or had two like six doors on it and each door had a different kind of latch on it you had to figure out how to open up the latch and it had the farm animals inside <laughs> yeah those little puzzles those educational puzzles that's a good opportunity to appreciate that you don't want to help people solve a puzzle if the purpose of the puzzle is for them to figure it out on their own that's the spoiler issue and it's not always easy to tell if, if helping somebody is a spoiler it takes away their chance to figure something out and get the thrill of solving it unassisted. Barry, is it is it cheating if you don't know how to work out a puzzle, so you ask somebody who you know does know the answer? Typically, we have. Typically what you Barry ask did it this a, morning with his air conditioner. <laughs> what you ask for is a hint, or typically they may not ask for a hint, but if they disclose that they're stuck, they're getting frustrated, you have to sort of assess the level of frustration and the level of effort that's, and time that's already been spent. And then you will do, there's a spectrum from giving a, a vague hint to a precise hint to disclosing the answer. And part of the um, challenge of, of being an educator is figuring out when to give a hint and when to give a better hint and when to when to just give them the answer. But also the idea is you want them to figure out how to reason their way to the answer. And that's why I like to use the Socratic method because it's a technique for leading them step by step by step by step to construct the answer stepwise. There's but also the tinker it's, method. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an art, it's an art. And, yeah, and you got the I, tinker the way, method, the Socratic method, got a bunch of methods. Yeah, and, and I don't know, I mean, I spent 25 years at the Science Museum practicing the art <laughs> of coaching people to solve puzzles without just giving them away. And it's, it, you know, every individual is sort of a unique case. You sort of have to find the sweet spot of how much help to give them when and how much time to give them to figure it out and not spoil it. So they, they end up with the, with the sense that they solved it on their own. I do have to give you more charity with your Socratic method. I, I see it, it's embedded in you deeply. <laughs> oh, it, it's very fundamental. It's, it's one of my core principles as an educator is to employ some version of the Socratic method depending on the, the person I'm working with. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it blows up in my face. Not often, but sometimes. You do need a lot of patience for that. Absolutely. But you also need the ability to figure out where the other person is cognitively and emotionally. And that's not easy to do. If you can figure out what do they know, what do they have a gap or a misconception, and what's their emotional state, the more you can pinpoint that, the more likely you can provide the, the, the correct amount of coaching at that instant. And that's an art. Yeah, and it leads to having too many tabs open when you're older. <laughs> Sam? Yeah, my older daughter, Amy, about a decade ago, when she saw my browser, she called me a tab whore. <laughs> hey, um, so I wanted to tell you about something else that happened to me this week, if I may. Are we at a point where I can introduce the topic? Sure. For some reason, Facebook decided to target me with a research study on BPD, borderline personality disorder. Oh, that's interesting. So I responded to the survey and uh, I may get a call from a doctor to determine whether or not I'm BPD. You are not, <laughs> you are not. <laughs> because, 
they have a new treatment for BPD. Yeah, I'm allergic to BPDs, and I am not allergic to you, Sam. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know what I am. I don't know myself, Stacy. Well, you're a systems thinker. First of all, <laughs> it's, it would be exceedingly rare for a systems thinker to be BPD. They're all, it's almost polar opposites. Hmm. I've got a feeling I have a a touch of. Um, so, um, what do they call the syndrome? Narcissistic uh, personality disorder? Something like that. Yeah. X is too close to B. Yeah. But the thing is, once you have identified it, you can um, eradicate it pretty quickly because you, become, you accept the fact that you, this is what you've got and you analyze the steps needed to address it. Over. Yeah, if you look up Axis 2 Cluster B in the um, North American Diagnostic Statistical Manual DSM, you'll see the four variations of borderline, which is sometimes called histrionic, narcissistic, sociopathic, and I don't know, I'm leaving one out, but maybe histrionic is the fourth one, I forget now, but, but there's borderline is one of the four in access to cluster B. And it's useful just to look them up, just to, unlike me, can't remember one of the four. <laughs> Historically, there's a lot of borderline psychopaths, um, people in, in the community, in prisons and that, you know, Charles Manson. Yeah, yeah, it can descend into criminal psychopathy. But sociopathy, narcissism, maybe histrionic and borderline are separate. I can't remember if they're the same or I think they're separate. Playing the accordion, that can also. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe we could change it to the Borderline Barn Raising Foundation, the BBF. <laughs> mm. But Sam, you're not borderline. I would, I would wage my uh, reputation on it. You're nowhere near borderline. I just responded to the survey and uh, they said, do you what? get angry? And I said, you know, I've been getting angry more lately. You know, so I better respond to this. Yeah. I have such a hard time with these labels. Because to me, it's like the same way when you would read a horoscope and it could match a million different, you know, a million different situations. I find the same with some of these labels. Yeah. Sam doesn't look like a crazy man, does he? <laughs> it looks a little like john lennon if you ask me again Very it's a matter stuff. of i'm gonna just do this with my hands again <laughs> the, the normal distribution and interesting by the way sam you're talking about how distributions drift over time so you have a leading edge which is innovation and a trailing edge which is obsolescence and but they also tend to spread out over time so we have the leading it edge of, of uh, technology like you know music technology and then you have the trailing edge which includes uh, a magnetic tape and, and 78 rpm records and piano rolls so you never really let go of the obsolescent tail is still there but then you have the leading edge which is the innovation and the reason i'm using this shape is th that's all you can do in two dimensions, right? <clears throat> but if you take a look at n-dimensional spaces where you get clusters of things, you know, in n-dimensional, see, it's those existence of clusters that just compel someone to apply a label. Doesn't yeah. matter who you are. You say, oh, I see a cluster over here. I see a cluster over here. This is a reminder. And labels are useful yeah. in that context. They're not useful if you eliminate all the empty space between them, or you think there are only three or four of these little nodes that require labels, stop it. No, so quantum I think orbitals again, are clustered. <laughs> Your quantum orbitals of electrons and atoms are definitely clustered. Yeah. Just specific, they're named orbitals. <laughs> right. So right. there's your, there's your uh, counter example. So again, it's a matter of whether those labels help a statistician slash probabilistician or whether they label in a social context oh. and without that nuance of understanding. Right. Yeah. Whether well, it's meaningful or not. It's a meaningful I think, in, in the atom molecule 
or atom uh, model. Hmm. Yeah, it's it. You're saying about Sam, somebody gives a, a certain indication one way or another that causes. Could you maybe you could be a little more specific? I kind of. I'm trying to. I'm trying not to give a comment out of out of sorts. So I'm asking you to rephrase what you said about. Um, winners and losers. I was thinking in terms of winners and losers with decisions. I wasn't indicating anything about winners and losers. Yeah, no, I, I know I was extrapolating. Um, so I, that's why I was asking. And then Barry Barry came in, and and so I I guess I lost the thread. Of okay, what, if what I, I may, to, just to respond yeah. to your request, I was responding to Stacy's notion about labels, and I was saying that if you look at big data in n-dimensional space. It's not all uniform. It's not homogeneous, okay? Certain clusters do exist and there'll be certain densities over here and certain emptiness over here. And those characteristics, if you look at it from a statisticians or probabilisticians or modelers perspective, they're worth naming because they're worth studying. And I'm just saying that those labels can be dangerous if applied incorrectly, right. which is Stacy's right. point. Yeah, factor right, analysis. Right. What, what are the relevant factors which are distinguishable? And then if you can distinguish the relevant factors and not you know muddy them up, then you can yeah. maybe make a model that's useful. Yeah, you might call them n-dimensional modes. That's one way to talk about it. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes a model can be neutral and sometimes it can be um, writing a narrative that can change the way things may be interpreted going forward. Science does that all the time. They change the narrative, right? Yeah. They did it with heliocentricity and various things. So while we're modeling, we're also potentially going into new territory or encroaching on the identity of old territory. So there are winners and losers with this modeling game. Alex? It's it's, the, it's rewriting the narrative of what is, and when you're projecting of, of winners or losers. That, well, no, it's not. It's not in terms of winners or losers. I guess it's the impact it has on society with these facts. Science doesn't care, right? But society will, and the winners and losers will. Niels Bohr was a winner with his first model of the atom, the very simple one that you see in the classical iconic diagram, but but it didn't survive very long. It, it was in a very simplistic model, which is a big breakthrough because he had a model, but it was overshadowed by the, uh, you know, the more the superior models much later. Yeah, you imagine the Olympic Games arena, and the the field is enormous. The track that goes around the perimeter where the runners do the marathon, that's uh, where the electrons are, and the neutron is the center of the atoms in the middle of that field. The size of a baseball or a watermelon, depending on the atom. But, but the tracks turn out to be little clouds of funny, funky shapes, like dumbbell-shaped clouds. You know, yeah. you have a dumbbell-shaped cloud this way, this way, and this yeah. way. Particles spinning, spinning particles of energy. <laughs> Stacy's got her hand up. Yeah. So you put it one ba one basic question: What if? So I'll say, what if we evaluated people using their own behavior as a baseline and looked at the differences that are around their own behavior? To me, that would be a better, a better model that focuses on, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I'll stop with the thumbs up. <laughs> no, this is, this is my point that I raised very, very early, which is this thing about freedom versus uh, social welfare, is that the people... I see, okay, the people that I observe really spouting this individual freedom being eroded business. That's the way I'm actually looking at them, is do their behaviors, their actions, their words, their thoughts align? That's, for me, one of the initial tests, and I believe that's what you're talking about, okay? I believe in sincere people behaving completely different than me. As long as their thoughts, behaviors, values, whatever are aligned, I can engage with that person. But if a person 
is not. In other words, they're contradictory. Nay, I, near, I, could I even say, um, uh, how do you say, hypocritical, you know? And if it's that way, then my next question is, well, is it only that way because they haven't thought of something, in which case I'll uh, explore that? Or are they intentionally this way because they know behaving this way gets them a result that they want? And that latter behavior is what I find repugnant from a social standpoint, okay? And that's the thing I was trying to raise earlier about this individual freedom business versus social goodness business. There, I think it's come around a bit. One of these things has come around full circle. Alex. Part of that um, <clears throat> social responsibility is personal and group honesty. You know, when getting getting sober in AA, uh, one had to analyze uh, the deep personal inner honesty that we were manipulating within our own conscience to overcome this temptation to drink and to be upfront with the other members of the group. Sitting sitting in an AA meeting, talking about how you behaved during the week, you know, and uh, that's, that, that came quickly. Having a bad memory also helped improve the honesty because if you wanted to tell lies, you need a good memory. Over. So it's uh, seven or eight minutes before the hour. Anybody care to share with some last thoughts or even first thoughts if you haven't actually yet. I just say that I'm progressively enjoying these sessions more and more as the weeks and months pass. Damn. You know why? <laughs> I think because the content is more to my interest and liking than it had been at the very beginning when I started attending these year and a half ago, or two years ago now, maybe it's been almost not quite. What would you name that content? Just so that we're all clear on what you mean. The content at the beginning? What it is now. What it is now? Or the um, shift, the, the delta. Shift. Oh, so the, the delta is more convergent thinking towards insight and less argumentation, picking a side and defending it. There was a lot of argumentation, pick a position and defend it and say, I'm right and you're wrong. And now we're sort of trying to work our way towards common ground of, of insight and joint understanding, which appeals to me. Me too. Well, I've been learning how to play Neil Young's song called my, Hey, Hey, My, My. <clears throat> Rock and roll will never die because there's more to the picture than meets the eye. <laughs> Neil Young, did you say? Yes. Okay. You know, that atom, the fact that the atom is 90% empty space brings up some intriguing questions about physics. Yes, and fascinating questions and profound questions and <clears throat> profound insights. Indeed. It strikes me as you say that, Barry, <clears throat> that some groups don't take so long to get to this point. Yes. But I believe that the ground rules that were set up early or assumed early kind of made us take quite a while to get here. Yep. And I'm not talking all of GCC. I'm just talking about the people who show up on Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think partly that's because you're, you and I are both strong in systems thinking. And so that's kind of become the, the nucleus of the, uh, the gravitational attraction 
towards systems thinking and away from the opposite kind of thinking, the wishful thinking and the unscientific thinking is sort of little by little attrited away. So would it be a bad idea to have a five-star rating for the, the value of the contribution these members bring to the group? <laughs> Little stars up in the corner of your avatar, that's just one, one to five. I'd be loath to do that and more likely to measure the rate at which the number of stars is increasing for any one individual. Like everything else, it's a different model. Yep. Well, every time some, somebody says something's good or bad, I remember the story of the horse that ran away. Right, the good or bad, but, think, but thinking makes it so, said Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. It's the direction that matters. Is it getting better at a decent rate? I mean, you can get better at a very snail's pace or very rapidly, you know, in some sense rapidly is probably better than taking 17 lifetimes. I will have to say <clears throat> that I've been in more than one of these kinds of forums. The very first one probably started February of 2011 in Palo Alto, and it called itself Serious Conversations. Hmm. There's still a group in Facebook I created called Serious Conversations as a direct result of participating in that group. Hmm. What I found a little bit frustrating about that group, and I know this is public, okay, is that I would raise questions bring up issues and they wouldn't get followed up oh so that's to me, disappointing. disappointing yeah and one of the reasons my son stopped coming is you know we we were at one point you know saying hey we need to reach the young people we need to do well so i brought each of my kids you know, well actually just two of my kids because only two of them were you know old enough to participate uh, at that forum <laughs> And my son raised the point, which was actually very interesting to him. It was about um, gun control. And it seemed like that would be such an interesting topic, such a critical thing for you know, society to engage with. And he got zero engagement on that one. Oh. So he stopped coming, he said, can't bring up topics. People just want to kind of treat it kind of as a social group. Yeah. And in fact, when I moved up here and I said, can I participate remotely? They said, nah, nah, we'd just rather be in person. So that again, smacked to me of, it's not really the ideas, the engagement around Nilda's ideas. It's more about being in the same room, you know? Coffee that's class. A bit different. The coffee clutch model. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to criticize all of that. I met a lot of good people there. And the real valuable outcome of that was, as I say here, if you meet somebody who's interesting, you take it offline, you have a one-on-one, -on -one, you, you know, see whether that goes anywhere, okay? So a lot of that happened out of serious conversations. And so I, I dropped out of that because they didn't have remote participation for quite a while. Well, then COVID hit. They had to go remote. Obviously, it worked. Obviously, people still got value out of it. So I just think that initial reticence to go towards a remote model was to me curious, shall I say. So I find that this particular forum is one that I've seen a trajectory to it. And I've really, in my own small way, tried to affect it somewhat. And I do see that uh, I, at least myself, I'm getting clearer with my own position on certain things and my own expression of certain things and my practices. So for that, I have this group to, uh, to thank. Over. That was an affirmation. That's a label. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> A positive label. <laughs> when you do a meditation and you you go this on this inner journey, you can discover a lot about yourself. 
and that a good a practice that's recommended to anyone who's trying to figure out something quiet peaceful environment and some deep breathing meditation the blanking out the monkey chatter i call this activity in the mind monkey chatter <clears throat> so focusing on the breathing and meditating really sort of uh, quiets it down gives you this clarity of thought so that you're able to focus better over may i say two things in response to that go for it one is I don't think meditation, and this is going to sound uh, contrary to what I've always been saying. I don't think meditation is a goal in and of itself, because I think that what meditation leads to is to live life in that meditative state as much as possible. Yeah. And to that extent, when I actually moved up here in 2016, it was just my daughter and me, you know, starting 2017, and then now. It's just me, okay? Well, and my zoo, okay? And I have people visit from time to time, but most of the time it's just me. So in that, and I, I, I gotta admit, it is a very privileged situation to find myself in, okay? Um, on the other hand, I have to, you know, wait like 50 plus years to create that for myself, okay? But in that state, I'm getting really, really close to being able to live that way most of the time. Even when I'm washing my dishes or doing my laundry or doing my cleaning up around the place or doing work, you know, I'm trying to get, obviously it's not always that way and I'm not even close, but I'm trying to get there, okay? Which is why in the last two weeks, I found myself losing my temper and I found, geez, you know, there's still so much that I don't understand about myself. Mm. That's what leads me to seek those who might be able to understand me better. Over. Meditation is like pondering, you know, it's puzzling something out. But occasionally, not in every, not in every case, you do arrive at an insight. And that's the product of meditation is a fresh insight, which you can then reveal. Disclose, you know, publish a, a, a little nugget. And it might have taken days of meditation to get to it. Days of pondering. There was a troubling experience that I went through once with my temper. And it uh, took a while, took a lot of work to get it uh, sorted out. It was a problem. The problem was my my heart, physiologically speaking, my heart wasn't connected very strongly to my head. And I had to strengthen that connection, uh, meta metaphorically speaking, in order to have this uh, appreciation of temper and losing, losing it because something's not going the way you think it should go. <laughs> Something, somebody's not behaving the way you think they should behave the way I think they should behave. So I have to live and let live. That's one of the, live and let live is one of the um, banners they have hanging on the wall in the groups, self-help groups, like the day at a time banner, over. Isn't that an expression of coexistence right there? You know, I do notice we're past the top of the hour. I'm going to go into a more uh, passive position now. You guys are welcome to go as long as you like. I'll probably bop in and out. Yeah. I'm going to get off and try to start my day. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. That song I posted, it's about the border, down on the border. And it's quite an interesting one, considering we were talking about the borderline defects of personality. 
borderline um, disorders of various descriptions. So if you get the opportunity, have a listen to that song, the lyrics anyway. Over. Oh, and I'll see you all Sunday, which is already Sunday here. <laughs> Sleep well. Any last words, Keith? If not, I think we're done. Barry, one follow-up point on your observation about these conversations becoming more palatable to you. Yeah. My word, not yours. Um, is I do sense that when you and I present our positions in some of these uh, yeah. conversations, we do have some, uh, some alignment. Absolutely. And Stanford systems thinking. We have, it, we have it in our DNA. So I do wonder at one point, you know, that's in a sense a convergent phenomenon for both you and me. It is. To some, it might be off-putting. Absolutely. They're not, not they're different. love systems thinking. I have my enemies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I've come to understand that I'm very willing to engage with people who disagree with me to the extent that they show up and honestly, you know, try to engage about disagreement. Yeah. But absent that, I am even more clear about the value of truth, systems thinking, clear expression, rational thought, science, true inquiry, right. true leaning in. Yeah. And to some extent, when I was on my own, I was letting all of this other stuff, you know, come and I would engage with it, you know, openly and curiously, et cetera. And I do see that when you arrived, that we began to Migrate. have a more, uh, uh, how do I say it? Intellectual, academic, scientific, yeah. contemplative. Yeah. And right. so to the extent that you were saying, oh, you didn't see anything happening or you weren't really getting much out of these conversations, you didn't have the larger picture that I had where I could see that there was an arc of movement going on. So that's just one thing I just wanted to point out and just sort of, you know, acknowledge you for uh, bringing that. Yeah. When it comes to dealing with people who think differently from me, um, this is not 100% of the time, but a lot of the times that draws me into, is one or both of us laboring under a misconception can I diagnose the misconception and get to the root of it? And that's one of the reasons that I become increasingly interested in the phenomenon of misconceptions. Yeah, yeah. But there's, but there's so, I mean, it's a lot of work. So if you talk to somebody who basically thinks opposite, it's a lot of work to diagnose, you know, what's the, where are the misconceptions, the, non, the, the non-overlap of thinking. But it's also a useful thing to do because our culture is thick with um, dangerous misconceptions yep. that are that threaten our survival as a species, as a civilization, as a culture. In fact, Barry, I'm going to paste this reference, which is really to me that point that you just made. That if we can actually choose to look at matters this way, in other words, rather than adversarial, to stand side by side and together perhaps even hand in hand or arm in arm, look at a thing that's in front of both of us and jointly try to understand that versus right. trying to do this adversarial exactly. thing. Exactly, 100%. That to me is a key shift. And Absolutely. that's why I put that as one of the key posts in this community of impact uh, group that I have. Yeah. 
And the more we do that, the happier I am, because first of all, I don't want to be laboring under misconceptions that I haven't diagnosed. And I don't want the rest of the world to be laboring under misconceptions that are leading us, you know, down the rabbit hole, you know, to going to hell in a handbasket and, and uh, you know, verifying uh, Darwin's law of, of nature that, you know, if you're, if you're blundering, you're probably not going to survive. Yep very long anyway good i'm glad you felt that and i'm glad you said that today and uh, hopefully that will lead to richer more curious yeah. explorations and inquiries and hopefully we attract yes uh other curious minded people and, and, and people and who raise, disagree raise the level of appreciation of systems thinking if not necessarily the practice because systems thinking is so rare in the culture that people don't even know that it exists or appreciate it, let or recognize it, let alone engage in it. And that's, you know, that's sort of the 30,000 foot view of the whole system. You know, that's almost like, you know, that's, that's where you get the sky god from. The sky god is the deity who sees the big picture. Well, us humans are also do our best to see the big picture and get an accurate perspective and an accurate calculus of what's likely to happen if we continue on the path we're on. I don't consider, I mean, I call that a theology, but it's really, it's, it's systems thinking is the modern descendant of classical theology. The theologians were the first pioneers of model-based reasoning. Crude, but they were the pioneers. You got to give them credit. Yeah. You know, um, when you say that about both of us being systems thinkers, I still don't know how to take that because I still don't know what a systems thinker is. <laughs> to me, everything that I'm saying is not grounded so much in systems thinking, although I try to, you know, explore that, but it's more grounded in just what happens when you have a ex certain exposure to mathematics. Right. When you actually think about what happens as you take this to zero or as you take this to one exactly. or as you take this to infinity right. or as you look at this relationship between these two factors. Or if you look at the rate of change of this or that or the other thing, you know? So to me, it's not so much systems thinking, although I understand the way people use that term, but it's more just, this is how math works. This is how just, you know, mathematical expressions and relationships get interpreted into regular language. Colloquial. Your father says mathematics is a language of relationship. It's also the language of models. I don't know, I mean, you, you can make models that don't have any formulas in them, any, any calculations in them, but the really good ones. But you can do. always see them though, even if they're not expressed. Yeah. And so mathematics is the, is the fundamental language of, for model-based reasoning. So for me, the practice of systems thinking comes down to the practice of model-based reasoning, which means constructing models that track real, observable reality and make predictions that, that come true. And so uh, fundamentally, it's model-based model reasoning is really just another synonym for what now is called systems thinking for all intents and purposes. AKA thinking. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but not wishful thinking, That's not true. pretending, That's not true. saying, That's not true. asserting something as if it's the truth and then That's trying true. to make the world fit to it. You know, that's, right. that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is this a good point to pause? Yeah, that's a good point. Tease, I thought I, I thought I saw Tease appear and then disappear again. He came back with some food and yeah. then he turned off his camera because he's eating. A lot of people turn off their camera when they got food in front of them. Yes, I'm eating. So uh, thank you. <laughs> I was listening, enjoying. Thanks for I being here. I was Tease. studying mathematics uh, lately, so I'm still going into mathematics. Yeah. I'll get retired, retired in the mid summertime. Yeah. So get more times for mathematics now. Okay, bye. Thank you.